you're going to have to spend some amount of your kind of energy kind of wondering what would people in other traditions think about that belief. For example, because one of, one of our, so, so I'll just give you the sort of six steps of the, of the epistemology, right? So at the, so at the lowest and therefore the strongest level, so we, so we sort of call it level one, are beliefs that you not only you think are true, but you think everybody agrees with you that they're true or at least the relevant community of experts would agree with you that they're true. So that's like the belief that, um, that Milton was born in 1608, okay, for the relevant community of experts. At another level, what we call level two, there are the beliefs that you think that are true and that other people would agree with you if they had the information that you have uh, or if they weren't making some mistake that they're making. So you have a theory of error for their disagreeing with you, right? Um, and the classic case of a, of a theory of error is you know, the, uh, the question of whether the earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the earth. And the theory of error for people who believe that the sun goes around the earth is it looks like the sun goes around the earth, right? So that's a pretty strong theory of error, but, but you know, we can explain why it doesn't. And so even though we understand why they believe what they believe, if they're, you know, if they're pre-Copernicans, we think we have a theory of error, we think they're wrong, and we're not particularly shaken by the fact of that disagreement, right? Then if you go up to the third level, those are cases where um, you think that people ought to grant that you have good reasons for your belief, but you don't think there's any reason they should believe um, or would believe if they had more information, right? It's not just that they're missing something that you see or they're misunderstanding something that you understand. It's that their experience is different enough from yours, their traditional upbringing, whatever it is, is different enough from yours, that you can understand they're not going to agree with you, but you nevertheless sort of demand of them that they grant that your perspective gives you not only a right, but makes it reasonable, rational for you to hold those beliefs. So that's sort of the third level. It's still a pretty strong level of epistemic security, let's, let's say, right? Then there's the fourth level where you're not sure, where you can't expect them to agree with you, but you're not even sure you have good reasons yourself. You know, you, may be, you, you really begin to think that, you know, maybe it's only because of your tradition, uh, only because of your childhood, only because of certain emotional, you know, memories or something that you're drawn to this belief at all, yet you still feel that you have that conviction. So that's where things get really marginal, in a way, in terms of the epistemic strength, but yet you might still have that very strong conviction. Level five is where you have so little reason to believe this is true, but you still find yourself hoping it's true. So that you move there from really belief to hope, and what we call level six is where you don't think it's true at all, but you treat it as an important symbol. You know, you say the creed and you believe two of the things there, but five of them you think are, you know, symbolically interesting, but, you know, um, they're not things you actually believe, but they think, you know, they're, 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 they're powerful, they, you know, they're, they're good for the music, I mean, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and, and then, but even at those levels, you can oscillate, right? So you may find yourself, and I think, I think a lot of people have the experience of being skeptical about something that's saying in a creed, but then finding themselves reciting it along with several hundred other people in a, in a worship service, find yourself for that moment believing it. And you can regard that either as what, as what Coleridge called a willing suspension of disbelief, you know, which he called poetic faith. You're sort of believing it for the moment because you're in that fictional world where it seems right to you. But there might be moments in which you slip into actual conviction, but it's not an abiding, sustainable, permanent part of your, your epistemic makeup. Okay? So across all those layers, it's, it's, you don't always know in advance, and, and it actually shifts over time where in that field you fit. And any of those could be subject to dialogue with people in other religions, right? You know, you'd, you'd sort of wonder what people in other religious faiths would think about your right to believe at any of those levels, and, uh, and you'd be interested in their criticisms of it. So you wouldn't only be restricting yourself to talking to them about things that you can all agree on. You can also talk to them about things that you disagree on, and that could be a, a vital and interesting dialogue across those religions. But I don't think what you'd be looking for is a syncretic outcome there where you'd say, okay, we're going to take a little bit of yours and a little bit of mine and, and kind of blend them together and come up with the true view. I think that's been tried and found wanting. Um, and I think it also would be a mistake to say, therefore, there's no truth to the matter. You know, you just believe what you're going to believe and we'll, you know, because it doesn't matter anyway. It's only our perspective on the ultimate reality that we can't touch. Um, but you also don't want to say, um, you know, I don't need to worry about you because you don't have a defeater for my view, and therefore I, don't ha I have no interest in, in any dialogue with your perspective. So it is a different kind of position on, on religious plurality.